uh, the end of Genesis 25, and you'll remember the setup. So here we have Jacob and Esau. And th this from Luther, we normally think of Jacob as the sort of, what, the dainty one? And we have Esau is the tough and the manly one. He's the hunter. He's the one out in the field. Jacob is kind of a mama's boy. But Luther's helped us understand the tense that Jacob is involved in. It's not just the home, but also the church, that Jacob is the theologian, that Esau is the one who's interested in politics and worldly affairs, that Jacob had the promise from God. And this is what's going to come into play in this text here. Jacob had the promise of God that the younger will, the older will serve the younger. And Rebecca was paying attention to that. Everyone else was ignoring it just out of mind. Jacob was also doing it. So we have this idea that Jacob, he is supposed to inherit the birthright, which is the promise of the Messiah. I mean, it's the seed promise given to Eve, given to Abraham. And, uh, and he, so he's looking for that. That's what matters most to him. Esau has other things. So he thought Esau is going to sell his birthright for a cup of stew. And that's what we're going to see this morning. So let's dig into it. Let me share the screen here and we'll, um, and we'll start looking now. I should, um, I should warn you. Oh, I warn you that my, my little tablet that I have for drawing, I left at church. I gotta have, I gotta get another one for home. So if I have to draw pictures, it'll be with my, with my mouse, which makes it look like a four-year-old's drawing, maybe a two-year-old. That's kind of fun. We'll see how it goes. Okay. So whoops, let me go back to where we need to be. Uh, Jacob, dial it back here. Uh, so we are, um, hmm. we are here in Genesis 25, verse 31 uh, and following. So, uh, so let's read the text here. I'll read it. I got it over here in the ESV. Jacob said, I'm exhausted. This is this exhaustion that Esau has. He wants some of the red stew. That's how the name becomes Edom, red, red hair, red stew. Jacob says, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? I, look, I'm at death. What, what do I care about birth? Now, this birthright of the, the, being the, what, the, the inheritor of the promise, being the one that um, through whom the world would be blessed, being the one who would have the kind of spiritual rights in the church, all this sort of stuff. Esau doesn't care about it. He just thinks he's going to die. So Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Now, again, we normally think, well, who's the good guy here and who's the bad guy? It looks like Jacob is the one who is tricking Esau. But this, the scripture is going to, Moses is helpful here. The Holy Spirit is going to say, look, the bad guy here is Esau. It was Esau who despised his birthright. But remembering now that it's... Um, uh, it was, it was Jacob's, it was the promise that was given there anyways. So the promise that the older Esau would serve the younger, that's now showing up. Okay. So let's get into Luther. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot here. I, I, I was, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what we want to do with Luther because we have a huge discussion. Maybe we have five pages on simony but it which i thought i would skip the whole thing but the problem is there's some there's some payoff at the end of the work here which is pretty important so i thought luther was way on a tangent for four pages but by the end of it he's he's kind of wrapped it up in a nice bow and and gotten to the point so i think i might I don't know. We'll see if I can sort of summarize here. So let's, let me get this first setup paragraph though. At this point, I'm reading Luther's commentary here on the right. At this point, it's an important question about the purchase and sale of the birthright arises for the birthright is something sacred and one uh, may neither purchase or sell it. 
So, so the idea of purchasing or selling sacred things is called simony or simony. Someone maybe knows how to pronounce that better than me. Simony, simony. It's, it's, uh, it's named after, remember Simon Magnus, the magician in the book of Acts, who wanted to buy the Holy Spirit from Peter so that he could perform miracles. And the idea of buying sacred things is then um, called simony. And it was the great, well, not the great, but one of the big criticisms of the medieval church that they people were buying and selling bishoprics, right? That you could go, if you were, if you wanted to be the, this bishop, you could go and you'd give a big donation and they'd make you bishop of this or bishop of that. And that's called simony. And it's forbidden by canon law. There's doing it anyways. But this question of the true versus the false simony, simony, someone better tell me how to pronounce it because this whole video, I'm going to be using that word. So the, uh, the, the what's outward simony let's go with simony what's outward simony versus inward simony of true and false that's going to be the whole thing that luther's going to be wrestling with consequently um one asks uh, is pastor nauman help me find the chain of events uh, no. pastor nauman i need you to tell me how to pronounce simony is it different if you have a slightly british accent that's a good question jim rhymes with jim simony okay thank you elaine so, so we're going with simony, like Simon. No, Simon. Simony named after Simon. For the birthright is something sacred. You can't. Consequently, one asks whether both did wrong. The one by selling his birthright, that's Esau, and the other by buying it. Lyra maintains, and remember, he was a Jewish commentator. I found that there's a book called Lyra's Influence on Luther's Genesis Commentary, which would be interesting to get. Someone can get that into a book report. He maintains that Esau sinned by selling it, but he says that Jacob did not sin by purchasing it because he was the firstborn by divine decree in accord with the statement, the elder will serve the younger. In other words, so here, Lyra says that it was only Esau who sinned, but not Jacob. Now, normally when Luther sets it up like this, here's what Lyra says, but he's going to say, um, but I think differently, but I, I, Luther never contradicts us. He, in fact, is going to go on to say that this is true, so that it wasn't Jacob sinning. Jacob, Esau was sinning by, by clinging on to the birthright his whole life and not giving it to Jacob, to whom it really belonged. Esau was in possession of the primogenitor, so primogenitor, first birth, the, the gift of first birth, that did not belong to him. Although he appropriated it to himself on account of his birth, he came out first. He did not have it by God's will. But as people are wont to say, possession is nine tenths of the law. <laughs> nine points of the law? Nine tenths of the law is how I, this is how my uncle told me that one time. My uncle Jim, possession is nine tenths of the law. And uh, that only helped to increase the theft that existed between me and my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Give me it. It's mine. Possession is nine tenths of the law. It was not helpful to tell three boys, three brothers, that possession is nine tenths of the law because it's not true. But here Esau has the possession of the primogenitor, even though it doesn't belong to him by God. For this reason, Jacob was unable to confuse him. Esau had the support of human right, divine right, and birth. So Esau had all these things going for him that that he was the firstborn, even though Jacob was the one that the Lord said, the younger can't. Um, you know, I can't, he, he can't, uh, the Esau has um, everything. The only thing that Jacob has giving him the birthright is the promise that the older will serve the younger. Everything else points to Esau. See the point. He's got, uh, among all nations, this gives the property of the lordship to the twin born first. The law grants him a double share in his father's possession. That is the first born stuff. Therefore, if God had not changed and revoked his rights, Esau's primogenitor would have remained unimpaired. Even though the Lord had given it to Jacob by promise, everything else gives it to Esau. But because Jacob knows the voice of, by the voice of God, that it belongs to him. See that? And why does he know that? Because the Lord said to, um, uh, Rebecca, the 
younger will the elder will serve the younger. He does not sin by buying his own right for himself. He did well, in fact, by watching for all opportunities to obtain the primogenitor that belonged to him. So you get the point? So that Jacob is actually doing the righteous thing. Here, Esau is claiming what doesn't really belong to him. And so Jacob's on, a, on the lookout for how to get that back for himself and to do it without breaking the law or so forth. That's so that he's actually, Jacob is actually doing right here. That's what Lyra teaches. And Luther's going to highlight that for us. This couldn't be done by any more convenient method than a sale, even though that pottage or morsel is not a fair price for the birthright. Nevertheless, it serves to ward off a lawsuit or obviate trouble, as the jurists say. It often happens that someone is unjustly harassed by sycophants who resort to legal proceedings against him, and either by producing false witnesses or devising other tricks, try to deprive him of his possessions as though they had been wrongfully acquired by him. This is Luther pointing out all the kind of wicked stuff that can be done under the appearance of righteousness by the courts. And that's really what we warn against in the 10th commandment, uh, ninth and 10th commandments. You shall not covet. We don't seek to get our neighbor's stuff in, in a way that only appears right. But there's an, it's an amazing thing. I mean, even now, how much damage you can do to someone just by accusing them of sin and taking them to court, even if they're innocent. and so nothing new under the sun. Although they could protect their right, people who love peace nevertheless give money to the sycophants in order to avoid their chicanery rather than to see the lawsuits through. This, you, you settle out of court just to make it go away. In this case, the common saying holds good. One must light two candles against the devil. Uh, Luther has a lot of proverbial sayings for us today. He's, he's in fine spirits when he's giving this lecture, I'm sure of it. Thus Jacob gave Esau the red morsel and freed himself of any trouble from his brother who kept boasting of the primogenitor. As a result, Jacob could keep his property and right in place. This is approximately what Lyra in a manner pious and godly enough for that time says concerning this passage. Okay, now we're going to get into this question of sim... How did we say it again? How come I... Uh, long I... Simony, Jiminy, Simony. For, uh, so we're going to get into this question about uh, Simony. And, and it came up because of the, uh, well, it's come up before in the commentary because of Abraham buying the burial ground. And this is one of these things that the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church was prohibiting, that you can't buy and sell uh, sacred things. That's a uh, that's breaking the list is this simony. What the burial is one of the things that's sacred. The purchase or sale of sacred things is called uh, uh, simony, uh, etc. The laws and canons call it simony when spiritual things are sold for money. So that's the crime that we're talking about here. They call the sale of a cemetery simony because cemetery is sacred. They call it simony to sell part of a parish or lands from benefices which they call ecclesiastical things so there's all this canonical law against um oh marjorie's telling me that either way i can pronounce it either way well i'll just keep going back and forth <laughs> uh uh so they condemned the bishops and roman courtiers who bought and sold bishoprics this is the you know how in the middle ages that the, the to be a bishop was like to be a prince and 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 these were available for purchase they were not supposed to be available for purchase so they were going around doing all this kind of nonsense to kind of cover it up but how, look at the, they're laughed at by the entire papacy which is actually full of simony and if you take simony out of the papacy you've already taken the sun away from it for the courtiers have no other business than to buy and sell sac sacerdotal offices priestly offices, bishops. Hence, to rid the Roman church of simony is to destroy it from the very bottom. Where will the splendor and pomp of the cardinals of the Roman curia be if you do away with simony? Now, here's the inter very interesting thing is that this is an old accusation against the Pope and the papacy and the Catholic church. John Huss made this, uh, all of the sort of pre-Reformation reformers were making this, even the kind of Catholic reformers who were in this at the same time as Luther, like Erasmus would have made a bunch of these kind of claims. And you see here of an interesting point 
Let me look at you guys in the face on this one. You see an interesting point is that for Luther, this is not the main deal. He is going to say there's a, there's a earthly kind of simony, but then there's a spiritual simony, and that's the real crime of the papacy. But he can join in this critique of the Roman Catholic Church, that they're buying and selling all this nonsense, that, you know, that people are ruling and, and have all these seats in the Catholic Church because they paid for them. It's all this kind of political nonsense. He can join in that critique, but it's not the main critique. In fact, someplace, I've been looking for this place. I think it's right. You, you know, the, you, if you'll hear all the time, hey, Luther said this and this, and half the time he didn't, never said it. But this sounds really right, but I can't, I can't find it. When he compares his critique of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, with the other reformers' critique of Rome, and he said, they grabbed the feathers, but I grabbed the goose by the neck. So this would be grabbing at the feathers of Rome, that they buy and sell all of these offices in the church. And Luther's like, well, of course they do. And of course it's wicked, but that's not the real problem. So we'll get to that, I think, eventually here. Uh, so... Um, so here, the entire curia would perish from the very bottom for the number of cardinals who have already swallowed up all church properties is too great. The cardinals uh, plundered and devoured the monastery of Agnes in Rome. I didn't know that there was this monastery of Agnes in Rome. I got to go over to Rome um, this summer. So I got to look for this place because Agnes was one of these great martyrs. Um, it's funny. Anyway. The, uh, thus, as simony is defined in canon law, everything is full of simony, and he who wants to take simony away from the papacy will be acting if he wanted to put the devil in heaven. <laughs> okay. John Huss and others who taught at that time censured this vice severely, but they did so in vain. For the Roman, uh, now, are you ready? For, this is somewhat, this is kind of typical Luther, but it's a, maybe a little bit harsher than what we're used to, so just prepare yourself here. The Roman Curia is a damnable institution, which all people should beware of and abhor. What instructions, therefore, would it give concerning faith and good morals? The papacy is a congregation of demons and of the worst people. They themselves condemn simony, and yet they live and are supported by it. For this reason, it is fitting that we are warned in Revelation 8, 18, Sorry, verse four. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. All its assemblages are of the devil. <laughs> He's not really mincing words here, is he? Therefore, let us shun them, lest we become a sharers in their plagues. Okay. But, okay. But this is the, but here's the point is that that's not enough. Just that you're buying and selling an office in the church and becoming a prince for this world. That does not get to the heart of the problem. We could excuse these thefts by means of some gloss to the effect that one should not call them simony because they're non-ecclesiastical uh, depredations and no difference between such simony and non-ecclesiastical seizure. Nobles fight among themselves about the seizures of land, etc. cetera. Um, but true simony, however, now here we get to the, to the, to the point, which is that there's a deeper buying and selling of spiritual things that the canon law and the Pope does not recognize. And that is the whole foundation of that religion. And this is getting to the Esau Jacob stuff. True simony is the sale and purchase of spiritual things for money. As for example, if someone wanted to buy grace, faith, love, miracles, and the virtues of the Holy spirit with which the church of God is adorned. Simon who gives us the name Simony tried to do this. Give me this power also that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. And remember what Peter was not so happy about that. Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. See, this is the, this is the crime there to obtain the gift of God with money. And it's not that the thing itself can be handed over by buying or selling for the Holy Spirit does not bestow his gifts for money, nor does God accept gold and silver for the forgiveness of sins, for life, eyes, senses, and all blessings. Here's the point, that God 
will give things freely. God will bless up with no cost. God gives gifts by grace and by grace alone. Now, notice here, by the way, that Luther is going to say third article gifts, the forgiveness of sins, and first article gifts, eyes, ears, and all my senses. In other words, it's not even just the gift of of salvation that's grace alone. It's the gift of life that's by grace alone. So that remember in the um, in the small catechism when we're uh, when we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? That God gives me my body and my eyes and ears, all my senses, my, my reason, all my senses. He still takes care of them. All this sort of stuff, and then. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. So it's not only eternal life that is by grace. It's also this earthly life that is by grace. This is a really important thing. No, God's munificence, I think this means like bountiful benefit. Someone tell me if that means something different. God's munificence dispenses his gifts to the grateful and the ungrateful. The only thing it demands is thanksgiving. We can't pay it back. That's not the, that's the point. If we try to pay it back, if we try to, uh, to, to give to God back for what he's given to us, then we're, we are despising the gifts because it's, you can't pay them. It's too great. So we say, blessed be the Lord and his gifts. So that divinity is attributed to him. Now, th- th- this, is a, this is a definitional thing. How do we attribute divinity to God? How do we say, God, you are God? That is, we acknowledge him as God, of whom we confess wholeheartedly by mouth and deed that he is the creator. For no other price can be paid for such great gifts. That we... But when we acknowledge that his gifts to us are not repayable, but are beyond price in his work of creation and also of redemption, that when we recognize that, then that is recognizing God as the creator. Can we look at that in the, uh, in the small catechism? We should, uh, this will di- be a different version of the small catechism. But we'll see it here. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has created me and all that exists, me and all creatures. He has given me my body and soul, my, my, what is it? Oh, man, this is very different. I'll just have to read these words. My limbs and senses, my reasons and all the faculty of my mind, together with food and clothing, house, home, family, property. He provides me daily and abundantly with all the necessities of life protects me from all danger, preserves me from all evil. All this he does out of pure fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any worthiness in me. And for this, I am bound to thank and praise, serve and obey. him. This is most certainly true. So I am bound not to repay, but to thank. See? Okay. That's what's going on here. But now here's the point, is that if we try to pay for these gifts, spiritual or even of creation, this is true simony. One should look at the intention and the desire that prompt the purchase or sale of sacred things. Simon's intention, for example, is (laughs) simonical, simoniacal, simoniacal. Someone, goodness, I can't even pronounce simony. How can I pronounce this word? Since it's his wish to be able to receive the Holy Spirit for cash. When we, we, this is the meaning of the words when we pray that God may be glorified and his kingdom is preserved. God cannot be debased or disgraced because he is in essence the very glory, power. He is in essence the very glory, power, and goodness. So he cannot, so he, he, he is not for sale and his gifts are not for sale. Our intention is desire such that we wish that God did not exist, that his glory were profaned. And we manifest this toward the word and the sacrament. Ooh, you, 
if we were able to harm or debase God as we do his word and sacraments, then indeed we would not refrain from doing even this. Hence, true simony is the traffic which is carried on with the word of God, the sacraments, the church, and the saints. This simony the Pope has not understood, nor does he understand it today, although the entire papacy is engulfed in it and has been long before it became simoniacal, simoniacal, I'm putting an extra symbol in there, according to the laws, for they used to sell heaven, the forgiveness of sins, grace, and the Holy Spirit for works or even for money. This accounts for such great number of Whoops, what, what happened? Uh, this accounts for such great number of churches, cloisters, masses, and indulgences, and holy orders. With these works, we wanted to earn God's grace. And there is the true simony, that by our works, by our uh, acts of obedience, even by our money, we can purchase God's grace. See that? I mean, this is, goes back to the indulgence controversy. Remember? A, a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So that... So that true simony is not purchasing a, a, a bishopric or an office somewhere in some church function. True simony is trying to buy God's grace and gifts. And this is idolatry that is destructive of God. It is our intention and desire. Here, Luther, this is talking about the, the sinful desire of the flesh. We wish that God did not exist that his glory was profane. This is the inclination of the sinful heart to take God off of the throne and put ourselves on it. And if God can, if his, if his gifts can be dealt with on the level of economic engagement, now I have, I have profaned God. I've made him common. I can deal with him. I can handle him. I can pay him off. This is, this is the ancient, this is the, the, the whole pagan business that I can offer some sort of sacrifice and pay off God and, 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 and somehow manipulate the, how the gods are dealing with me. It, it, it makes God into a man or it puts ourselves over God. Where do we see this? This is also in the large catechism. Remember the large catechism, which is the best. Uh, this is... Um, that is the large catechism. First part, Ten Commandments. First commandment. This is where uh, I'm going to the end of this. Is Luther's explanation of the first commandment in the large catechism? Um, This is as you make God into an apple God by you think that you can pay him off. Uh, ah, here it is. Okay. There is another false worship. So I'm in large catechism, 10 commandments, first commandment, paragraph 22. There is a, moreover another false worship. This is the greatest idolatry that's been practiced up till now and is still prevalent in the world. Upon it, all the religious orders are founded, monasticism and so forth. It concerns only that conscience which seeks help, comfort, and salvation in its own works. And by doing this, it presumes to wrest heaven from God. It keeps account, notice this banking word here, it keeps account how often it is made endowments, fasted, celebrated mass, etc. It's a, there's a ledger of the good works and good acts. On such things it relies and of them it boasts, unwilling to receive anything as a gift from God, but desiring by it to earn or merit everything by works or super irrigation, super works, as if God were in our service or debt and we were his liege lords. 
Wow. Wow. You see that I don't want to receive things from God. I want to earn them or deserve them by my whatever. And the result is it puts God in our service and we become God and he becomes our servants. Now we think that, do, do, do you see the, 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 the utter pride that is, it, it is hidden behind the humility of works righteousness? Well, I'm God's servant. I got to serve him. I got to do this. I got to do this, right? So it, it, I, I'm, I put my, I, I, I'm serving God in such a way that, so I'm trying to earn, he did this for me. I want to do this for him. That All that kind of business looks like humility, but it is the, it is the precise opposite because I won't let God be God and give freely to me. I want to earn it or deserve it or come out of his debt so that God now is in debt to me and it just flips the tables. I'm unwilling to receive anything as a gift from God. That's the ultimate idolatry. What is this but making God into an idol, indeed an apple God? Uh, setting ourselves up as God. This reasoning, however, is a little too subtle to be understood by young pupils. So we go back, we are acting as if we are not young pupils. Back to this. In this manner, they, I'm back to Genesis here. In this matter, I, there's a lot of things happening in the chat, but I'm, I, I want to keep going for a little bit because I got to, we, I, I got to press a little bit fast on this because there's pay coming off at the end, but it takes a little while to get there. In this manner, they make a peddler of God who would not bestow the kingdom of heaven without pay, but would do it for a price and merit. Even though he offers it gratis free, they nevertheless scorn the freely bestowed favor and contribute a hundred or a thousand goldens for building cloisters, churches, and the like with which to, to buy grace and God's benefit. Is this not trafficking in grace and the forgiveness of sins? And this is the kind of person the Pope was when he was best when he uh, and with this kind of simony he filled the entire world to the extent that the world is nothing else than a cesspool of true simony for what else are the societies doing than to receive money and to regard profit as godliness this is 95 theses stuff indulgences and everything strictly speaking it is impossible to buy grace it is as if you were attempt this you would be like wanting to milk a he goat <laughs> just let that picture sink in a little bit you're trying to milk a he goat and there's a uh there's apparently a saying that someone's milking a he goat and someone's holding a sieve underneath a sieve like a you know you you so you're you're milking the he goat and i'm holding this uh uh bucket with holes in it <laughs> this is not gonna it's a it's a double it's a double stupidity it's a double utter fruitlessness the pope milks the he goat the people hold the sieve underneath as the proverb says even if it were possible for the Pope to be reformed and for crass simony to be purged away, they nevertheless cannot be purged of true simony because this is the soul of the Pope. That, that forgiveness and grace is an economic exchange. So this is it. Okay. Uh, now, how, how we, can we get back to Esau and Jacob? I think so. Thus, one can see what great dangers and evils there are in the papacy, how great the abyss is, how horrible the entire world has been swallowed up through the primacy of the Pope. We should hate the beast with a perfect hate. I hate them with perfect hatred. What psalm is that? Psalm 13, maybe. Nevertheless, they are still fighting to keep his primacy safe and intact. What else would this be than to restore simony to life? It's such surely horrible blasphemy and a misuse of the name of God, and it'll be punished with eternal condemnation. To such a point, they have dragged the word the name of God and the church, yet nothing has been bought. They only imagine that God's nature is such that he wants to sell grace. The intention and desire are simoniacal. In reality, there is a sieve and a he goat. Yet, by nature, this evil is implanted in the hearts of all human beings. If God were willing to sell grace, we we would accept it more quickly and more gladly than when he offers it gratis. Ah. So not only is this the problem of the Pope, that, that God, here's God's graces for sale, but this is the problem of 
all of us. And Luther here points out, and this is amazing, that if God were to sell his grace, we would give everything to buy it, but he gives it away for free, and so we despise it. Remember Naaman, who, who, the, the Syrian uh, army officer who had leprosy, and, and, uh, and he, he brought, bought all this clothes, and Elijah said, well, just go wash in the Jordan River, and he, he, it was too easy for him. Formerly, when simony prevailed, this is back when, you know, when the Holy Roman Empire was, when, when Wittenberg and so forth were all Roman. The people were exceedingly eager to build countless monasteries and churches because it was a sale and purchase of the kingdom of heaven. Now, when it's offered free and the statement is made, God has sent his son into the flesh to bestow eternal life on all who believe you have earned nothing but deliverance from death and sins. The Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven are given freely, gratis. Now the world disdains this mercy and munificence of God. Formerly, when we were taught how that we could earn grace by our works, all eagerly devoted all their efforts and means to this, just as the little town of Wittenberg gave a thousand goldens to monks every year. So this is an amazing thing. What a monstrous, ominous, amazing state of affairs it is that the world spurns deliverance from sin, death, and hell, deliverance offered free through Christ. If simony were to prevail again, all would generously pour out their wealth. But when we teach it in accordance with the word and commandment of Christ, receive it for free, give free to preachers, ministers, and schoolmasters, it's like telling a story to the deaf. Indeed, they even rob those whom they should honor and help. But these are not horrible ragings of darkness. Thus, every human being is a simonist, and yet no such sale can take place. For neither to any human being nor to the monks has God. <laughs> it's interesting how Luther is like, I'm not sure if the monks are actually human beings. <laughs> to any human being nor to the monks has God given anything else in return for their vows than the flames of hell and eternal tortures. God's gift of salvation must be free. That's what it means to be God. That's the point, to be able to give freely. One can see how pitiable and dangerous a matter it is to have fallen away from the proposition of primary importance, the proposition concerning justification by faith without works. When you lose that primary proposition of the doctrine of justification, that God declares us to be holy, apart from our own works or efforts, then everything else starts to fall apart. And this is why this is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. When it's been obscured and obliterated, the entire world becomes addicted to simony. That works righteousness, an economic form of works righteousness. The Turks strive to placate God with their works, to buy spiritual things for money merit. Simony in the name, like uh, that described in canon law, for they purchase and obtain nothing for a price. Uh, for a price and merits, but that intention and desire is taken root deep, deep in the human heart, in your heart and in my heart as well. It's what the old Lutheran theologians called uh, the thing that I, the, or, the lex, the, or, the, 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 the opinio legis, the opinion of the law, which is stuck deep that, down there at the roots of our heart, which says that if God is mad at me because of my sin, he'll be happy with my good works. That I can that 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 salvation is somehow a matter of exchange in which I am involved. Every human being is a simonist by nature and would want God to be so constituted that he would be appeased by human works and merits, and that one could point out to him, to God, I have done as much and have fasted much. These things thou shouldst consider and should sell me salvation and eternal life. But God neither knows nor hears such workers of iniquity. He sets forth his will in the apostolic teaching, by grace you have been saved, and not because of works. When that grace has been done away with, there is no longer any difference between the Turk and the Pope, the heathen and the Jew. They are all seminists and milkers of he-goats. This is works righteousness. Whew. The simony of the canis is less serious, only physical. It should be referred to as robbery. So this is the business of buying the bishopric and everything else like this, because Luther says there's this kind of deeper root. They don't even recognize. They can't even see it. 
Why? I've wanted to call attention to all these things in order that it may be understood what true simony is, and in order that we may continue in the pure doctrine, which teaches how God has given us his Son, and through him all heavenly and spiritual blessings, which the world wants to purchase for a price and does not want to accept gratis. Now let us return to the account. <laughs> okay, now so we took a long trip uh, there, and it's time but let's so we, we got a couple of minutes so we'll just wrap it back to jacob and esau it appears that jacob insisted on the purchase he cannot be excused and freed from the offense of simony for he states plainly sell me your birthright but what right then does he make this demand and commit so great a sin that he tries to purchase the blessing which is spiritual and pertains to christ and future events all of which are sacred and concern the future life in this life, all things are unholy and polluted, but the sacraments and the sacred acts were not instituted for the sake of this present life, but in order that they might be sacred preparation for a future things. This is an amazing insight here. The Lord's Supper was not given so that we would be... Um, well, think of it this way. The Lord's Supper was not instituted so that we would be full. Like... If you went to a restaurant and you sat down and they gave you a little sip of wine and a little piece of bread, you would not leave that restaurant happy. It's not a meal to sustain this earthly life. It's not, a, it's not given to the church that, it, that the church should become rich. If the church was ever, for example, to, to sell the Lord's Supper, if you pay this, you can come to the Lord's Supper. This is not what it's for. It's not for this present life. It's for the life to come. It's a preparation for future things. By the gospel, I'm prepared, reborn, and renewed for the future life. It has not been delivered to me in order that I may become rich from it. He who is a pastor and preaches it, the gospel, in order to acquire riches and the glory of this world is a simonist. simonist. If you take the gospel and you're like, now I'm going to use the gospel to, make, to, to, to become a rich or wealthy or even what, to achieve things in this world? It's not why the gospel is given. The benefit of baptism is I am transferred from the bosom of my mother and out of the grave and I'm put back into paradise, out of death into life. That's a beautiful explanation of baptism. I am not seeking there the joys and pleasures of this world. But I make use of the spiritual gifts in such a manner that when those that are physical come to an end, I am brought out of this life to eternal life and to immortality. Therefore, he who serves as a pastor and absolves or administers the sacraments in order to obtain glory and power by doing so is a simonist according to that crude definition of the canonist. He is not one of those who are more subtle and want to earn eternal life their works. Just outward crude simonist. Just. But why then does Jacob demand that the birthright be sold to him? And since he wants to buy the birthright, it follows that this is a business transaction. I answer, Jacob saw the opportunity by which he could get possession of the birthright, and he wanted to take advantage of it. So here is Luther's understanding of what Jacob was up to. We get around to it, which is not going to be a matter of simony, but rather a matter of opportunity. Because it was Esau who was lying and deceiving by holding on to the birthright and not handing it over to Jacob. All right. I, uh, Luther's going to go on about this thing for, you know, for a while. I, I think this is probably a good enough spot to, to actually stop for this week because I saw about a million, you know, hundreds of questions fl flowing in the chat. So maybe let me just check in, Pastor Nauman. Is there anything in the chat that we should cover before we, um, before we uh, stop recording and let everybody jump in that would be necessary for clearing up what we talked about here? I don't think so. The, the comments are just so uh, beautiful. Well, good. Well, let's let's shut it down. I'll say a prayer and then um, and I'll stop the recording and then we can jump in and and talk some more about this as well. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we give you thanks that your gifts of life and life eternal come to us freely without payment or cost. We pray that you would um, by your Holy Spirit and by your word 
that you would root out all simony in our own hearts, that desire to earn or deserve your great gifts, and that we would rather uh, that you would be set apart as holy, and that we would, as is fitting, uh, simply receive from you all your gifts and benefits. For we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen.